Enjoy your meeting. Just a reminder, today's meeting is being recorded. All right, so we're going to get started. Welcome to today's webinar, uh, Decoding Talent DNA. We have a very exciting session getting started with us. Um, presenting today is going to be Cindy Lynch and Rhonda Holloway. They are partners at 620, um, and they are going to be presenting Decoding Talent DNA. So with that, we'll be recording today's webinar. Uh, at the end, we're going to leave about 10 minutes for questions, which you can type in the chat box on your screen at the bottom left. Um, and we will let you guys know when the question session does start. If you do have any questions, please type them in the box uh, if you think you're going to forget them. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to Cindy and Rhonda. Good morning, everyone. My, Good morning. my name is Cindy. And I'm Rhonda. And we're pleased to be co-presenting um, this session this morning with you all on Decoding Talent DNA. On the screen and in your chat box, you'll see a link to take a predictive index survey. Some of you have, have already taken one. Some of you may be wondering, well, what is a predictive index survey? Um, I'm sure all of you, it being recruiters, are very familiar with uh, using behavior assessments in the hiring process. That's what we're going to be discussing today, and it's how we, we help to objectively uh, define the DNA of talent. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with our topic. So think about right now in your own job. So this is a moment to think about yourself. How is your success measured in your job? When you're, when you're given your uh, annual reviews, when you're given feedback on your job performance, what is it that you're expected to do? And, uh, it, it, and how is that going to be measured at the end of the year? And part of that job, I, I'm going to assume, is to hire the very best talent that your organization can afford. Um, and your results are measured on, on that, okay, can I get the best talent I can afford? How quickly can I find this talent? And how quickly can I get them assimilated, up and going, uh, and up and being producing into the organization? And I would ask you uh, in, in your mind, what else are you um, measured on by your company to do? So when we look at decoding talent DNA, we say that people are like icebergs. What you see is, is on the top of the iceberg. People come into your office for an interview, or when they come in to give you, or when you look at their resume, what you're looking at is what they want you to see. It's what's on the outside. It's the education. It's the experience. It's that the company that they come from. Those are the things that we can observe. But people are much more complex than that. And think about <coughs> excuse me, the number of times that you've hired someone and you thought you were really hiring a great candidate, a great employee, and you know, 60, 90 days later, you're like, where did that person go? That, that's not who I hired. And it's because people can project certain things on the outside, and, and we've all seen that. So what we're talking about today is, how do you really get to know what the person will do in the job? Not what somebody says they're not going to going to do, but actually what they do say. Anymore, getting a job is a lot like um, auditioning for, for, for a part in a movie, a part in a play. And we, some people play that part really well. The sad thing is a lot of times your best candidates are, that are going to do the job the very best don't always interview well. And the people that do interview well often find themselves into positions where they can't deliver. So again, how can we get to the, the truth of the matter of what the person can do in the job versus what they say they're going to do in the job? So what drives exceptional performance? Three things. A person's knowledge, what they know, um, how quickly they learn, their, their, the cognitive agility of someone, the skills that they have learned 
through education, through experience, on-the-job training. And the other thing is behavior. Again, you can hire people that have great credentials. They could be the smartest person in the room, but if they have to do a job that requires leading, motivating other human beings, it doesn't matter how smart they are. Um, they're going to fail, fail at the job miserably. And again, think about the times when people do not work out in a job. A lot of it is because of things they do and they don't do. They can't get things done on time. They don't have attention to detail. They cannot interact with other people. They don't know how to motivate other people. And those are the things that cause critical problems within the organization, and they're very expensive. And with, it's only been within the last 40 years that we've ever been able to really assess the behavior part of people. We've been able to assess cognition for a long time. Behavior assessments are really just catching on um, big time in, in the corporate world, even though they've been around for, for 40 years or more. So we, we, we always like to show, so show this slide. Usually when we're in a room, uh, we like this because it kind of gets a big chuckle out of everyone. And, and it looks a little silly having, having a cow diving out of the water. But we use this as a point about the job. So if the job could talk, if you could sit down and have a conversation with the job you're trying to fill, what would the job say to you? What would it say about what's required to be successful in the job? If the job, if the job is to dive out of the water and just be a good diver, then our cow has good form and he looks like he matches, matches the job well. But if the job also requires diving underwater and holding your breath, the cow is, is going to fail and flounder. And oftentimes what we find in organizations is a disconnect between what the person, the hiring manager, is looking for and the information that the recruiting side uh, or the recruiters have been told. We're working off older job descriptions. Um, we've had a, had a passing conversation, or you're working off a job description that describes more of a unicorn than somebody that can actually do the job. So the first part of the process of decoding talent A is actually decoding what you need in the job. Again, if the job could talk, what would it tell you it needed to be sex successful? Does it need someone to be patient? Does it need someone to be focused? Does it need someone to be analytical? Does it need someone that can motivate other people? Those are the things that drive success. Um, we're, we look at our, we put our process into four steps, and we call it DASH. So we just talked about defining the job, which is getting very clear on what the job requires. A stands for attract. How do you, now that we know who we want, how do we attract that person? And S stands for select, and H is higher. So let's, let's unpack this and look at each one of these. So the first one is define the job. Um, we, you use statistics every day in your job, in different things. All businesses run reports, they have dashboards, um, they're, look, they're using analytics. A lot of times we use more analytics to buy uh, equipment, software, than we ever do on people and jobs. A lot of it is that people aren't aware that this kind of science and technology exists, or they think it might be a little complicated or overly expensive. And, and that's not the case at all. Um, these tools are, have, are becoming more and more uh, um, accessible and definitely worth, more than worth, the cost, uh, cost of this hire. So you think about the cost of turnover. Um, Rhonda, what are, what are some of the statistics on turnover costs? The U.S. Department of Labor Statistics estimates that if you turn over an hourly employee in the first year uh, on the job, that it's 30% of their annual salary. And if you, as you move up into executive ranks, it is up to 200% of their annual salary if they turn over in the first year. That's fully loaded of 
all of their um, salary costs, benefit costs, the cost to replace, the cost to train, and in certain positions, certain executive positions or sales positions, it also starts to calculate in some opportunity costs because if you hire a salesperson that doesn't produce, then you've lost revenue as well as sunk cost. And, th and that ad adds up very quickly and a lot of organizations sadly don't do a very good job on trying to capture those costs, understand those costs, and understand how what the ripple effect is. Um, if, if you're in a company that doesn't really look at that, there are a lot of tools available out there, different tur um, turnover calculators. I know SHRM has one. Uh, we have one that we can share with you. But it is an important number to get a hold of, to understand. And numbers always get um, executive leadership's attention. So when, you, when you've got something that's costing a lot of money, and it's creating um, an expense in, in the organization, and we know that not having the right people is expensive, turnover is expensive, and quite frankly, people that are bad hires are expensive. Um, you think about the difference between what it, the top 25% of your performers are producing, whether it's revenue, whether it's good customer service, whether it's good coding, um, accuracy. It, what they're, the value, the economic value that they're bringing to the organization is huge. If you were able to, let's say, clone that top 25%, think of that. If you were able to actually clone that top 25% and find more people like that, what kind of impact would that have on your organization and on you as an individual contributor because that's your job. Your job is to try to find the best people that your organization can afford. Um, so when you have an objective process that we're talking about right now of defining the job using objective statistical analysis, you're taking all of the subjectivity out of it. And I, I know a lot of you have done this for a long time. Some people are really good at, at hiring off their gut. Most people, quite honestly, are not. Um, it's a skill that has to be learned over a period of time. So if I'm a, a, a new recruiter um, or I'm new at a particular organization, I've never done hiring for this type of role before, my gut is not going to be very reliable. I, I don't have any experience to relate, to relate it to, so I'm going to need some ramp up time. So we're taking all that subjectivity out. Um, it also prevents the halo effect. You know, a lot of times we talk ourselves into hiring people that may not be an exact fit for the job because we like something, we see some potential in them, we think, wow, we, we, we need this person. And we start morphing a job to fit that person. Um, the other thing, the other reason you want to find a job is we all have certain biases. We might look at a resume and think somebody that came from a northern university is going to be smarter. Um, the people that um, smile more are, are, are more team players, or they're friendlier. People that like dogs are friendlier. There, there's all, people's glasses are smarter. There's all kinds of different things that we're not even aware of that create that halo effect. So again, we want to get that out of the equation. Step two, attract the right candidates. Once you have a clearly defined job description, how do we find them? And once you have that, it all starts with that clearly defined job, but once you have that objectively uh, mapped out, you can write more effective job ads that have a more um, impactful, they resonate with the type of candidates that you're looking for. And we'll give some examples. Um, third, so here we've um, identified what the job looks like, and on the right, we're going to compare the person to what we're looking for. That, so that's the selection. How well do they match? So we use a tool called the predictive index to do this. And the predictive index is an unbiased view of talent. Um, I'll say that the predictive index is um, EEOC compliant. The tool has been around for 60 years. It's 
available in 80 languages, including Braille, and every time that it is rolled out into a new language, it's validating. Every, uh, every decade, the tool as a whole is validated. So this, this tool has been under a lot of uh, scientific rigor. I think some of you on the call have actually taken the survey. We did put, again, the link in the chat box so you can take one if you haven't. And most people find the tool very easy to take. It's two questions. It's fast. It's six and a half minutes. And it's extremely accurate. So what does it tell us? It, in the, it tells us in the self what comes naturally to a person. This tells you what the person will do in the job, not what they say they're going to do. If this person sat down and is applying for a sales job and they're, they're going to tell you they can cold call, this PI is going to tell you it doesn't matter what's coming out of that person's mouth. This person's not going to cold call. The self-concept tells us how they're adapting to their environment. So when you're looking at bringing people into an organization, the self-concept tells you how they're adapting and what kind of stress that's creating on the individual. If a person is stressed in their current job, it, we can see that here, and we don't want to bring them into a situation where they're going to be stressed in the new job. A lot of times people leave one job and they start looking for a job like the one they left, without ever really thinking or understanding that they're not even in the right jobs to begin with. The synthesis is how people see them. So the synthesis is what people see. That's what shows up in your interview. That's what you're talking to. The self-concept is who they're trying to be, and the self is what comes natural to them. This is an example. So let me back up just a little bit. I don't want to go into too much detail because I know all these dots don't really mean anything. But let me back up and just say what, what behavior assessments measure, almost all of them measure the same thing. They measure how much dominance a person has, how much extroversion, their patience, and how much formality they have. So in this case, this person has a lot of formality. Um, they tend to be patient. They tend to be, they're uh, not tend to be, they're very much an introvert, and they are somebody that is more, they're lower on dominant, so they're more, how can I help you, more of a harmonious situation. This is a person that has a high degree of expertise, wants to always be right, is always going to be more concerned with quality over quantity, um, always going to do a very exact job is uh, looking for ways to improve things, make things better, more efficient, um, analytical problem solver. They prefer to work independently. doesn't mean they don't like people. It doesn't mean they don't get along with people. It just means their preferred work style is working independently. For example, computer programmers, developers, scientists, um, your bookkeepers, um, these great make good customer service people. They're very focused on solving or improving something. This isn't going to be a person that's going to be a natural salesperson. They don't even enjoy talking with people that much. But in a team sale, this person is going to be a great um, subject matter expert, and, and that can be very important. So one of the benefits of having clearly defined jobs is, let's say this person comes across your desk, and they're a great fit. It, you know, Their briefcase is full of, education, experience, um, things that you're looking for. Okay, they may not be a good fit for the job that you brought them in for, but they may be a good fit for something else. And this brings us to the second point is, again, these objectively defined job patterns. So the, the first step is to objectively define the job. And how this comes about is we send questionnaires to key stakeholders, and we ask you, we ask, what do you think the person needs to do to get the job done? Do they need to have, it's questions like, is a high degree of accuracy is important? Is working consistently important? Is doing the same thing over and over important? Is influencing other people important? So it's questions like that that get around of how the person's going to do the job. What are the behavior requirements, again, if the job could talk, 
what would it tell you, what kind of person would it tell you it needed to be successful? In this case, this job is telling you we need somebody that is very deliberate, um, patient, focused, stable. This isn't a person that is going to be inventive and creative. They're going to follow the process. So I'm thinking if, um, I don't know, if I'm in the hospital, I, I, I want, in my meds, have been, I'm on a medication treatment, I don't want the nurse coming in and say, well, she had a yellow pill yesterday. I wonder what would happen if they gave her a blue pill. I'm tired of giving yellow pills all day. I need to do something different. That's not what we want in our, in our nursing staff. That's not what we always want in our customer service staff. Um, this person is a, a problem solver. They're analytical. Again, they like working on their own on independently. They, this person doesn't enjoy leading teams. We, well, this is one of my pet peeves, and you're starting to hear it now, but almost all job descriptions say we need team players. You don't need team players. You need people that can get along with other people. This person is not going to be a team player. Um, this person doesn't enjoy team activities doesn't in, really enjoy um, going out after work and socializing with, with people at work, especially if they don't like them. The fourth step is to hire, after you hire people, then you've got you've to hang on to them. So when we look at turnover, turnover is either we've hired the wrong person, or once we've hired the person, we've handed them off and they've been mismanaged and they quit. So you can do the very best job you can, sourcing candidates, recommending candidates, um, but once you hand them off to the hiring manager, if the manager doesn't manage them properly, doesn't onboard them properly, then what you have is people that are dissatisfied in their job and they end up quitting. So our, our, the, again, our, our four-step process is to find the job, what do we need in the job? Objectively define the job. Attract the right candidates. Select for fit. So here we have our job pattern. We've defined the job with the job pattern. We write a job ad that's going to attract the person. For, so for example, in the previous, if, if this is our job pro, our job pattern, our benchmark, our target, whatever you want to call it, to write a job ad that attracts this person is, do you like being recognized for doing a good job? Do you like the opportunity to focus and gain expertise? Do you like being uh, working independently on projects? Or do you like working on projects where efficiency matters? Do you like solving problems? Yes? Oh, I heard it echoes. Okay, my apology. Versus when we say, you know, most job ads read, they tell about the company. We're a Fortune 500 company. We have great benefits, blah, blah, blah. Um, we're looking for people with a four-year degree, um, good communication skills, team-oriented, you know, things that don't really matter to the job. Um, this person doesn't like competition. Um, so if you're trying to get a salesperson, then you say you like being recognized for your own activities. Do you like being in a competitive environment? Do you like having the opportunity to be in control of your, of your day and have shifting priorities? Those kind of job ads are, are going to attract very different people. So when we have, so let's say this is our target pattern. This was actually um, a study that we did for Disney. And they were looking at their maintenance people out in the park. They identified that these maintenance people were one of their critical hires. And how they came to that is that they're out there every day and they're, not only are they keeping the park safe, but they're kind of, you know, boots on the ground and that they're at seeing what's going on. So if they see somebody in trouble or they see somebody that, something that doesn't look right, an unsafe situation, a person, uh, uh, an attendee that, that's ill or something, they're all over the park and they have their eyes on everything. They notice that something's dirty, something's out of place. So they really decided that was the most critical job they were hiring for. So what they wanted was this type of pattern, a person that's going to do the same thing 
the right way how they're trained. They're not going to make things up. They're going to um, so even the way that they put things on their trucks was very important. You know, six feet on either side of the ladder. The cones go in a certain place. You keep your toolbox on a certain place on the truck. Your toolbox is organized in such a fashion that every toolbox looks the same. And when they hired people, they wanted people that were going to replicate the process that they put in place, not change it. They wanted to hire people that would be happy working in a position that had that kind of um, safety rails, if you will, that kind of control. There are people that thrive in that kind of environment. They don't want to make a decision. Um, you know, sometimes we talk a lot about empowering people to make decisions. Some people don't like that. They don't find that empowering because they want to know what's expected of them. They want clearly defined expectations and they want feedback that they're doing a good job. They don't want to have to make it up or make changes. So that's this type of person. So we now know what we want in the job. We have a manager who looks quite different from our employee. So you could even these could be any kind of shape, and I know the shapes don't really mean anything to you, but what you can see and observe is that if these represent human behavior, that they're different. So this manager needs to uh, this manager is very um, fast driven, fast paced, direct communicator. It's going to be demanding, wants things done quickly, wants things done exactly right. May not always give as much information as this person is going to want. <clears throat> this person, the manager, is liable to spit out things very quickly. Um, I want you to do this. I need you to do this, this, and this, and expect someone to fill in the gaps. This person doesn't want to fill in the gaps. This person wants to know what everything is before they get before they get going, before they start the job. There doesn't, they don't want any ambiguity. Um, so this manager needs to understand their communication style, their work style, how people are going to perceive them in the workplace. They, then they need to understand what's important to this person and this job <clears throat> so they can motivate and coach appropriately. So now we've got everybody in Disney agrees that this is what we need for our drivers, our maintenance drivers. So now the, the, the um, organization is in agreement and they're in an alignment of what drives this job, this critical job. We all understand what kind of person we need and we all understand what's important to that person. We know how to onboard this person. We know how to communicate. We're not going to make changes quickly. Change happens all the time. This person adapts to change very, very quickly. And a lot of times he can't understand why this person cannot. It's <clears throat> not that this person can't adapt to change. It's that they need a little bit of time. They need to understand. They need some training. So don't just throw something on them and the next day say, well, this is the way we're going to start doing things. You know that change is coming. And you can start preparing people for it. Again, this person doesn't need that. You know, this person's willing to change because it's different or it's new, exciting, it seems better. This person doesn't think change is always a good thing. This person isn't going to change just for the sake of change. They want to change because they know it's better. So again, understanding what we need, how to communicate for it, how to coach for it, how to motivate this person so they'll stay, that is where your retention comes in. Now we know that this is what we want. Um, when Disney went through this, they knew that not every person driving a truck, uh, the maintenance vehicle, was going to match this pattern. Sometimes you're going to have candidates and it becomes um, very difficult to match the pattern example. But at least, so here's our candidate or our employee, at least we see what the difference is. Right? So <clears throat> the key the key non-negotiable behaviors for this job is accuracy, consistency, taking your time, don't rush, don't take shortcuts. And so this person doesn't match exactly. This person is more of a problem solver, more analytical. So we're not going to not, not um, interview them or not hire them because of that, but we're going to manage effectively. 
we know that the job does not require innovation. We don't want innovation happening. We know this person is going to innovate. So we handle that on the onboarding process. We know by, by um, your, your behavior assessment tells us you're a problem solver. You like solving problems. We're open to solving things and making things better. Our, and, we, and when you have a good idea, we're very interested in hearing it, and we do want to hear about it. We just ask that you not implement anything on the job. Um, you know, we're highly regulated. We have rules, policies, procedures that we need to follow. So we just ask you that when you have ideas, you bring them internally. And this person's going to do that. This person's very respectful of authority in the chain of command. So again, who am I? What does the job need? Who do I have? And how do I hire and manage appropriately? Now, I think one of the things that, and this may come up as a question, one of the things in technology that we're seeing is there, there's so few people, there is a war for talent within technology. There's just not enough um, technology people to go around to fill the need. So a lot of times you are going to, um, you're going to hire people regardless of what their behavior is. You don't have that luxury. You've got 10 openings and you've got eight candidates and, and you need them. Um, but at least going into it, you know how to manage them appropriately. And your manager understands how to keep them engaged and keep them motivated in the job so they don't leave you. So again, as a recap, and we're getting up to the end of what um, we had to share with you. If you have questions, you can type them in. But again, um, define the job, go through an objective process, attract the right candidate, create a job ad um, that is going to track the kind of person that you want, go through a process to select for hire. We've had many of our um, HR people uh, and recruiters that go through this process tell us it actually saves time. It cuts down your time to hire in half because you're not spending so much time on candidates that really don't have the basic what we need. So let's go back to our Disney example, right? So you've got, you've got 100 candidates coming through your, through your uh, pipeline um, and you've got 100 resumes you're looking at. Well, if you do the PI early, we know that if you're not attentive to detail and you're not going to follow the rules, you're not going to fit in this, in this um, environment, in this culture. You're not going to do the job how we want it done. So I'm not going to spend time interviewing you, setting up interviews, phone calls, or, or going through the resume. I'm going to go to the people that have a natural propensity to do the job. Same with the sales. So it cuts down a lot on that time that you spend vetting candidates and it gets you very quickly to the top ones that you want to reach out to. And then, <clears throat> you know, a lot of times the most difficult part is because now this becomes out of your control, you're having to hand off the candidate to a manager. And a lot of times you're just hoping and praying that they're going to, um, they're going to treat them right. We, um, Rhonda and I um, put together a special offer for uh, TAG members. <clears throat> we really enjoy working um, within technology. We work with a lot of technology uh, companies. So we've done this quite a few times. It's always very eye-opening, um, interesting. I don't think we've ever done one of these where we didn't uncover some surprises. And so what we're offering is to analyze one key position within your company, much like we did with the Disney. So what is something critical in, in your organization? What would that job look like in objective terms? In other words, to create a job pattern. Um, do we agree on what that job should be? Again, what you're looking for and what the hiring manager wants and what the COO may want, you all may have very three different ideas of what that looks like. So when we start collecting this data, um, which takes 10 minutes, and we start seeing that we're all different, have different ideas, that's the first place we have to start. 
because we have to all understand and agree what drives success in this job. And then we're going to have some of your top performers in that key position complete the PI assessment. So <clears throat> we're going to essentially validate or not validate what we think success is. We all may think that the job requires somebody that's fast paced. Um, but when we start looking at our top performers, we may say, you know what, this job, this job really to do well requires focus. We're wrong. Um, the data is telling us the people that are most successful in this job require focus. We missed that. So you're able to validate what you think um, you knew, either right or wrong, and then you make your adjustments accordingly. Um, we, and then we look at the analytics. Again, we're using analytics to create this uh, or validate this job pattern. And then we share the results in a strategy session with your leadership team. So in other words, you're giving us, we kind of like this, you give us your data, um, and we're going to put it back to you in a different format, in an objective scientific format, Let give it back to you and show you what it says about your team and perhaps um, what everyone is thinking and have a discussion on how we can get on the same team, same direction. So that, if you're interested in that, um, reach out to Perry. Um, I think you all have her email with your name, um, um, contact information, and that you would like to take advantage of the benchmarking offer. And either Rhonda or myself will reach out to you to schedule that. Um, that's all that I have. We would love to answer any questions that you have. Yeah, so folks, if you guys want to type your questions into the chat box, we'll just give it a minute, um, see if anyone has anything to say. And from there, if anyone doesn't have anything to say, we can sign off. But we'll just put you guys on pause for a minute so you guys can type some questions up if you have them. All right, so I have one question. Um, is there an opportunity to take your assessment test and receive the results? And that is the, yeah, a big, thank you, big yes. There, in the chat window, there is a, a link. I just put a, a link up there. If you go to that link, you can fill it out, complete the assessment. And you'll be you'll put in your contact information. As soon as we get the results, we'll reach out to you to schedule a time and share those results with you. And other than that, <coughs> that's the only question I've received so far. Um, so okay. I think that I think that was it. But like they said, you guys can email me if you guys need any further information. I can put you guys in contact with Cindy and Rhonda. Um, Cindy, Rhonda, thank you so much. This was such a great presentation, and I think everyone got a lot out of it. Um, and do you guys have any last minute things to say? Just no, feel free to reach I, out. We love working with uh, technology and uh, companies and um, we would like to thank TAG for the opportunity to present to you guys. Great. Well, thank you so much, y'all. We appreciate it. And everyone have a great weekend. And the webinar will be up on our YouTube channel uh, by Monday next week. Thank you.